Cozy TV is celebrating Columbo 50, the 50th anniversary of the Columbo TV series. Here is David Koenig, author of the new book, Shooting Columbo, The Lives and Deaths of TV's Rumpled Detective. In conversation with Cozy TV creative director, Tom Hill. Welcome, David. Thank you, Tom. Happy to be here. You began this project, I guess, probably a, a fan first. Like, what, 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 uh, what brought you to Columbo? I've been watching Columbo since I was a little boy in the 70s. It was my mom's favorite show. We only had one TV in the house. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I was the channel changer. You know, it, <laughs> there was no, no remote controls. Um, <laughs> so everyone in the house watched Columbo every third or fourth Sunday, whenever it, whenever it was on. We never missed an episode. And even though it wasn't targeted at kids and it's still sort of a, an adult show, uh, the character is just so amusing and interesting, even though I was just a little kid, I fell in love with the show, always stayed with it. And then after the show was gone, I wanted to know more about how did they put these together? And I'd heard rumors about, hey, I heard Peter Falk, who's this lovable character on screen, could be sort of a, a difficult person behind the scenes. What really happened? What's the real story? And that's when I started years ago, digging into it. Um, and then over the last couple of years during the pandemic, it gave me the opportunity to just finish it off. You know, it's uh, Columbo is Peter Falk and Peter Falk is Columbo. And a portrait emerges from your book of this, uh, I guess maybe tortured artist is too much, but he, 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 was, he, he was an artist. He uh, could be incredibly charming, irascible, both back and forth. Tell me about your impressions of, of, of Peter Falk as you dug into the, the history. Yeah, I mean, that is the, the real life Peter Falk was Columbo. And I think because he puts so much of himself into the role, it's really why that, that character and that show are enduring. The concept is great, you know, it's unique and the mysteries are good and they're all well made. But without the characterization of Peter Falk, it would just be a show that people watch and then forget about and move on to the next one. He makes it, you know, Im imbues it with life and color. Just imagine a character who was a real life Columbo, but with the power of being a movie star and a little bit of a temper. And you have exactly Peter Falk. It, it was wonderful to hear some of like the, um, the ad lib moments that of course drove producers crazy. Well, the way Peter Falk worked with Columbo because he thought that he was the character and knew it better than anyone else is he would try not to um, sometimes not even read the script before he arrived that day on the set. Sometimes he would read it, but would never memorize it because he knew he was going to be changing every word anyway. So there was no reason to memorize it. He was gonna turn every single line of dialogue into something new, the way the real Columbo would have said it. So that's how he worked and often that led, first of all, to take after take after take, because he wasn't trying to nail a particular line, which he could have. I mean, as an expert actor, he was making things up as he went along, trying out different reactions, different pauses, different accents, and entirely new pieces of dialogue. Um, so it would be you know, up to 30 or more takes for a single little uh, snippet of film, and that also encouraged him and others to ad lib. His, his most famous ad lib came in the second season where he's investigating the death of uh, a fella in a, in a swimming pool and he accidentally walks into the pool and gets his shoes wet. In the very next scene, he's in a nice mansion, which was filmed the very next day. He's in a nice mansion uh, interviewing a, a upper crust fella and out of nowhere, he asked the fella, hey, how much you pay for those shoes? Oh, uh, sir. Yes? You don't mind if I ask you a personal question, do you? No. What'd you pay for those shoes? I think about $60. I stepped into some water yesterday. I ruined mine. You don't know where I could get a pair that looks like that for around 16 or 17. 16 or 17? Sorry, I, I, I don't really at the time. And it was so natural and fitting to the character. And, and Peter was so fond of that line that a couple episodes later, he ad-libbed an entire scene, uh, the episode Etude in Black, which was the John Cassavetes okay. episode. So they needed another uh, a few minutes to pad it out. They wanted it to be a two-hour show. 
Um, so he and Cassavetes, they rented a, a famous mansion and went there and for like seven, eight minutes, they just started ad-libbing. Can I ask you a personal question? Please. What are you paying taxes on this place? $18,000 a year. Three times 18, carried to 24, seven down, bring down to zero. Place cost you 720,000. 750,000. And, it, and it's a very amusing scene. Um, but it doesn't advance the plot much, but it's a it's a marvelous scene. <laughs> I know you you mentioned that uh, you know even the the existing sort of Peter Falk interviews uh, were often he he's a he's a storyteller by nature. So that, yeah, uh, well, Peter Falk was the was the was the best and the worst. I mean, in that he's such a had terrific, colorful stories. But most of them weren't true, <laughs> so that was that was sort of a challenge. Is it, they were always sort of colored to make them uh, they make them a little amusing, not necessarily to make him the hero, but just to create. He was a storyteller to create the best right. possible story, so that a, a normal humdrum decision, all of a sudden he places himself in the middle of something, and it becomes a, a barn burner of a tale. There you go. It's got to have a, a, a punchline. Oh, for the yes, sake of exactly it. right. It's like the uh, the gotcha moments that he uh, cherished so much. Uh, that that he was he was upset. The the gotcha moments at the end. He called them the pop, and he was insistent, especially as the years went on, and he was running one hundred percent of the show um, in the later years. Um, every episode had to have a gigantic pop, a big gotcha. And if you watch the earliest episodes. Some of them do and some of them don't. Peter Falk didn't like that. He thought the best stories had the big finish. And so every single episode had to be this stunner clue out of nowhere that you just went, whoa, you know, and, and that was his, his insistence. The difficulty of writing a show, which is basically about two characters just circling each other for two hours. You know, the, the ones just hounding them, asking them these questions about something insignificant. There's no car chases. There's no big fight scenes. There's, there's no guest stars that come in and sing a song or <laughs> there's, there's nothing else except right. for uh, uh, this guy asking the other guy questions, annoying him piece by piece, strand by strand, unraveling his, his alibi in, until he just uses those pieces to, to tie the net at the end. And that's a very difficult show to write. One of the little stories that delighted me was the, uh, was the choosing of his car. Because I, as I thought about it, you know, he's, of course, it, it, of course, it doesn't make sense. Why would Columbo drive that car? And yet it's those things that are just a little off that make it so perfect. And so, you know, so unique, I guess. That exactly exemplifies what Peter Falk brought to the character was not only how he played the character, but how he su insisted on surrounding the character. These, these odd little, little things like, the car, which was selected very early on before the first or second episode was shot, they needed, he was an LA homicide detective. So they were going to give him a normal, you know, Datsun or <laughs> something like that, whatever a yeah. cop would normally yeah. drive at that time, especially a slobby cop like him, you know, who much didn't care about his surroundings or being pretentious or anything like that. And they went to the three story uh auto park garage at universal studios where they parked literally hundreds and hundreds of cars and they walked up and down the aisle uh, levinson and link the creators had picked out a few that they thought would be you know these really brown dull cars that would fit Colum it would truly fit the character of colombo and they showed it to nah 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 and they didn't know what he was looking for because he was so insistent and then he sees at the end, there's this little odd shaped nose poking out from the back end. And he's like, oh, what's that? And so they fall him over and it's this 1959 Peugeot. Uh, it was beat up, but uh, you know, it was sort of an, a very rare exotic car. The last thing Columbo should be driving. He's like, this is it. This is the one I want. And they were like, you've got to be kidding me. This <laughs> is like the anti-Columbo car but they realized they were short on time to get that episode uh, into filming. They'd been fighting with Peter Falk for like two months straight to get this show started. And they're like, the car, you want the car, you got the car. And I guess there's a similarly, the, the, the raincoat, the infamous raincoat. That was, uh, 
out of his wardrobe. Right. Yeah. The, the original raincoat uh, uh, that Peter Falk claims that he, before the very first pilot prescription murder in 1968, they wanted to wear a heavy overcoat. Um, but he misread the script and it said raincoat. And he thought, ah, I've got the perfect thing. And he went home and got a, a several year old beat up raincoat out of his closet and came in and wore that and claims that for the rest of the series, he wore the same raincoat. The, the truth is probably not quite that black and white, because if you look in the very next episode, he's got a slightly different raincoat. So I, I suspect he really did bring a new raincoat in that was his own. But whether it was the first raincoat that lasted one episode or was the second episode that last or second raincoat that lasted like 20 years, that's probably the true mystery. I was also uh, I was uh, amused by the uh, the ID badge. There's a controversy that has erupted in recent years that the creators of Columbo never envisioned, and that is what's Columbo's first name, um, Levinson, Link, and Peter Falk decreed that we would never know, and in fact they didn't even know. They created the character, and they intentionally did not give him a first name because they were determined that. Columbo would be sort of this mysterious character who just sort of, you know, a third of the way into the show kind of just somehow ambled into the movie. And then at the end, he ambled yeah. out and, you know, into the fog to disappear. And we never saw his wife and we never saw him at the police station. And we didn't know a whole lot about his personal life. He was very mysterious and we certainly would never give him a first name. Um, but what happened is in about the third or fourth show of the season, they needed a scene where Columbo flashes his ID that has his badge on one side of the wallet and has his driver's license or police identification on the other side. So they left that to the prop department and the prop department uh, created an ID and where there's room for a signature, they scribbled the name, legible though sloppy, Frank Columbo and put it in the wallet and used that ID in that wallet for almost every show during the se during the first run, the first forty some shows of the uh, of the series. Um, Peter Falk was never aware that his name was Frank. Levinson and Link certainly weren't. Um, it was just something done by the prop department. Um, they figured on old Zenith, you know, thirteen inch TVs, there's a it, it would be literally impossible to read that it said Frank. And in, in fact, that same ID was used in a later episode for another character who was not even Peter Falk because they knew no one could read it. We just need some ID. Ah, give them that Frank Columbo ID. I think the one thing we can safely, I, I assume you'll agree that the one thing that really can be left out of the canon is Mrs. Columbo. That's another mystery that people have argued is, was there really a Mrs. Columbo? Because during the, the first run of the series, and it, it, actually all 69 episodes, um, I think in every single one, he refers to Mrs. Columbo, but we never mm. see her. We never see a picture of her. Oh, and I can't find my wife. I think she's aboard. Uh, she's about, oh, about this tall. She's got black hair and then wearing it up today. It's like well, in a we, bun. You didn't have we to... have got 500 passengers embarking. Yeah. So. I can say it's a big boat. Ship. Ship, yeah. What seems to be the problem then, Watkins? Uh, Mr. Colombo, he has lost his wife, sir. He's obviously exaggerating there somewhat. So people have argued, was there a real Mrs. Colombo? But in a, mm. there had to be. So episode one, and somehow 24-year-old Steven Spielberg gets to, gets to helm it. How did that happen? And right. What a wonderful well, choice. Well, the, the first pilot was Prescription Murder in 1968, um, mm. in which everybody was ready to turn this into a series. Oh, my gosh, this is, this is a blockbuster. It had, I don't know, like 40 million people or something watched the show. They, they loved it. They demanded more Columbo that he get his own series instead of being a supporting player as he was in, in the pilot. And Peter Fox said, no, I'm not interested in doing a series and went off until he needed the money and then finally reluctantly agreed to do the series. He originally agreed to do just six shows, 
but uh, the network was able to sort of twist his arm and say, well, it's been so long, we want to do another pilot. So that's a seventh show. And then he wanted to direct an episode. So they said, well, we'll let you direct, but you've got to do yet another show in case yours doesn't turn out. So he ended up making eight shows that first year instead of six, which allowed them the next year to turn his contract into eight shows and then eight shows again. Um, but for the very first show filmed, they got uh, Levinson and Link, who were the creators of the show and the, the primary producers and, and writers. Um, they directed that themselves, uh, an episode called Death Lends a Hand with Robert Culp hmm. for the second show uh, called Murder by the Book, starring Jack Cassidy. They wanted uh, to bring a new perspective, something they wanted every show, since there were only going to be six or seven of them, every show to feel different and to feel like a first class movie. So it was, there was this hotshot director named Steven Spielberg, and they said, we should use this guy. This guy's incredible. And at first, Peter Falk was like, uh, this 24-year-old kid, what are you talking about? But after he saw him work and his unorthodox procedures and just the brilliant work he created, it turned out to be one of the best episodes ever. Um, he said, oh my God, I can hardly wait to work with this guy again. And the episode was so good that Levinson and Leake said, you know what? this is better than our episode. Let's flip it and make the Steven Spielberg episode be the premiere episode of all the episodes. Um, and uh, our own episode, will save that for episode two. So, I mean, how these were not two very humble gentlemen, but they realized, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is the best one. This is the best director we'll ever have. And it became the first Columbo. I was always amused by the, the casting stories early on. I, I, I trying to picture the Bing Crosby version. Well, they when uh, Levinson and Link first sold Prescription Murder to NBC, um, part of the deal was they didn't want their best creation to be abused, so they wanted some sort of input. And the person who the executive in charge of that, Dick Irving, said, "Well." not only will um, we give you input, but I'm personally going to produce and direct this pilot, which he did not that frequently. He was, he was one of the executives there. Um, so they had input into casting and they said, well, who do you think? And they wanted uh, uh, their first suggestion was Bing Crosby to play Columbo. They'd seen an old movie of his called Man on Fire, which showed that he was a good dramatic actor. And they, he was doing the Christmas specials where he'd have his family and he'd be in a sweater with a, with a pipe. And he had kind of that laid back older, and they had written Columbo to be an older character. Um, so it was, he was written to be this old, unassuming, you know, grandfatherly type guy with a little spry little leprechaun type uh, wit. And they thought, oh, that's Bing Crosby. He'd be the perfect Columbo. And, and now you look back at that idea and think, that's preposterous, you know, that, that was ridiculous. But at the time to them, it sort of made sense. And, and, and they had actually approached Bing Crosby to say, will you play Columbo? And he was moving into semi, in his mid sixties, moving into semi-retirement and wanted to play golf and knew if he made a pilot, they'd want him to do a series. And then, you know, a Christmas special was good for him. He didn't uh, have any interest to do a, a pilot or a series. So then they wanted an actor named Lee J. Cobb, um, who was sort of sure. a tough guy, uh, uh, old time actor, slightly older, not quite as old as Bing Crosby though. And he was unavailable. Um, so then Dick Irving said, well, let me give you a suggestion. What about Peter Falk? His agent got him a copy and says, Peter Falk would kill to play this cop. And Levinson and Link were like, Peter Falk, first of all, he's like half the age of, of the person they envisioned. You know, he's in his mid 30s, not 70. Um, and then they also knew Peter from New York. They'd never worked with him directly, but they'd heard the stories of how he could be difficult and sort of take over um, characters and take over productions. And that's the last thing they wanted um, was mm -hmm. to lose control of this creation. Um, and Dick Irving was of, of the opinion, you know, well, if you can find somebody better, I'll listen. But if you can't, we're going with Peter Falk. And they finally consented to that. Um, and I can't imagine anybody, anybody doing anything 
better or different. It just nails it perfect. Celebrate Colombo 50 with six great episodes this Saturday, September 18th, here on Cozy TV.